Good morning, seventh grade. Welcome to lesson 12, where we're going to be reading chapter seven of Across Five Aprils by Irene Hunt. It's a little bit of a shorter chapter. There's only five questions. So let's take a look at those questions that come from the Lit Plan Teacher Pack put together by P Teachers Pet Publications um, by Mary B. Collins. So there's only five questions today. They are one, how did the community show support for Matt Crichton that spring? Two, what news did Dan Lawrence bring? Three, what kind of letter did Ross Milton put into his paper? Four, why did Jenny stop making plans? And five, how did Guy Wortman get what was coming to him? One of my favorite parts of the book. Um, so let's take a look. We're going to switch to looking at the book on the screen. I do also have my own book at home now, which has all my little writing all over it. And at one point I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna read from the book and point at the map um, as we go along. So I'm gonna go going back and forth between the two. I encourage you to have your book handy so you don't get too confused. Um, let's start with chapter seven though, which is on page 108. Men from all over the county came to Matt Crichton's aid that spring. From as far away as Newton, Ross Milton and Sam Gardner were able to collect enough for a set of, a, of double harness and a wagon. One man brought over a plow. Others brought in loads of grain and hay for summer feeding. They cleaned his well, and more than a dozen offered a day's work in the fields whenever they had time to spare it. Immediate neighbors gave Matt their promise of raising a new barn as soon as the pressure of summer work had eased a little, and a dozen men from other communities volunteered their services in the project. So remember at the end of chapter six, the barn had burned down and the culprits had also defiled the, the well by putting coal oil in it, so that was ruined, and all these men have come to help Matt, not only because that horrific event has happened, but also because of his heart attack or stroke, he's no longer able to work as, as much and they are showing support to him in all of these ways. The great mound of ashes in the barn lot was soon beaten into a hard packed mass by driving rain and the heat of spring and early summer. Jethro became used to the sight of it after a while, but he could not become used to the fear that lived with him every night during the early weeks of that summer. One of Ed Turner's boys brought over a dog to a play, to, play, to take the place of the shepherd that was never found. It was a huge dog, as fierce looking as a wolf, but soon devoted to Jethro after young Sam Turner had taught the boy how to become the dog's master. It brought some comfort to every member of the family to know that the big animal lay stretched at the foot of Jethro's bed, his sharp ears alert to every sound outside the cabin. But from Matt down to John's youngest boy, there was a nagging fear that even the presence of the dog did not dispel altogether. An anxiety that lurked in the backs of their minds day by day and came out boldly in the night. More and more stories of Shiloh came through the county as Illinois boys who had been wounded in the battle began pouring into Cairo, Illinois during the months of May and June. George Lawrence from over near Granville heard that his youngest son had arrived in the river town and he made the long trip by wagon to bring the wounded boy back home. It was Dan Lawrence who brought news of Tom Crichton. Israel Thomas and his son-in-law had volunteered a day's work in Matt's fields the day George Lawrence brought his boy over to the farm. They stopped their horses at the end of the furrow and went out to the road to talk to the two in the wagon. Later, they called to Jethro asking him to tell Ellen that they would not be up to dinner that day. They would work straight through the noon hour and go home a little early. Dan Lawrence was not yet 20. He was still weak from his wounds and loss of blood, still under the cloud of a horror that only subsequent horrors could make him forget. He walked slowly with his father's help up the path to the cabin where Matt Crichton stood at the door. And when Dan extended his hand in greeting, his eyes had a tired, haunted look. His father spoke for him. We're bringing you hard news, Matt. It's your boy, Tom. I'd rather be whipped than be the bearer of such news, but we knowed we had to do it. I brung Danny over to tell you how it was. 
he was with your boy that day. Dan Lawrence told the story quietly. His voice wasn't as firm as a soldier's voice should be, but he did his best to control it. Things have been so fine for quite a spell. I never see a part of the country that looked purtier with the peach trees in bloom and the air so soft and lazy. Us boys was feeling good. There was lots of time for swimming and setting around and talking about what we do when once at the Rebs was licked and we was home again. Tom and me was together a lot them days and we'd done a good deal of laughing and joking. Tom's spirits was always high. You wouldn't have believed in them first days of April that trouble was a brewing for all of us. Everyone was feeling good and we was getting along so fine. The young soldier glanced up at the white faces watching him and there was still in his eyes the look of wonder that life could have changed so suddenly and ruthlessly. He seemed to waver before the necessity of describing the day that followed the first five of that April. It started at breakfast time, all of a sudden, and terrible. I ain't never heard such noise or seen so many boys and men laid low. It was just one awful roar of cannon and screams. That was the worst. Maybe I had not to say these things. He looked timidly toward Ellen, who sat close to her husband, her great dark eyes staring and without expression. Matt finally spoke. We want to hear everything, Danny. Go ahead. We got through the first day and toward evening, Buell's reinforcements commenced to come in from across the Tennessee River. And it was a sight that gave us courage and joy for a few minutes anyway. Tom was standing beside me when we seed the boats coming and both of us took off our caps and waved and laughed like we was crazy. We was caked with mud and tired enough to drop, but we forgot everything when we seed Buell's boys coming in to help us. I mind that Tom put his arm alongside my shoulders and he was saying, look at him come Danny, bless old Buell, he's finally made it. Them was his last words. He, he didn't suffer. He never know what happened. So what has happened here? We remember last time we read a little bit about Pittsburgh Landing um, and they were, um, the first few winds were up here in Northern Tennessee. They pushed down to here now to win, but it was a terrible win. Um, and Buell is another one of the generals. Now Grant last time received some terrible, you know, like he was caught off guard. But Buell is another general who has brought men in to help fight because they were kind of overwhelmed and outnumbered. Um, so they're looking at and they're standing up and ex excited that help is coming. Unfortunately, as they're standing and looking, that is when Tom was shot. Um, so that is the hard news that, um, that Dan Lawrence has brought. Not only that he was shot, but that he, he died. But um, the good news is he just, it was quick. The news spread through the county very quickly. The week after Dan Lawrence's story had been heard in Newton, Ross Milton printed an open letter in his paper. To the patriots who defiled the well and burned the barn on Matt Crichton's farm sometime during the night of May 10th, 1862. So it's a, a letter in the newspaper, kind of like you'd write a letter to the editor, although the editor is the one writing the letter and he's addressing it to these supposed patriots who um, had done these terrible things to, to Matt's barn. So this is what he says. Gentlemen, in the event that you feel Matt Crichton has not been sufficiently punished by the destruction of his property, be advised that he suffers not only that loss through your efforts, but the loss of his 19-year-old son, who died in the Battle of Pittsburgh Landing on April 6th. Has justice been done, gentlemen? Has an ailing man who commands the respect of those in this country, or in this county, who recognize integrity? Has this man suffered enough to satisfy your patriotic zeal? May I remind you, that Tom Crichton died for the Union cause, that he died in battle, where a man fights his opponent face to face rather than striking and scuttling off into the darkness. And just in passing, gentlemen, what have you done lately for the Union cause? 
Of course, you have burned a man's property, barn, farm implements, hay, and grain. You have polluted his well with coal oil and terrified his family. Furthermore, you have done it quietly under cover of darkness, never once asking to be recognized in order to receive the plaudits of the county, country at large. But has any one of you faced a Confederate bullet? Well, Matt Crichton's boy has. So you need to kind of sum up what is it that he is saying in this letter? Who is he addressing it to? So it's obviously these people who have burned the barn and whatever. And what is his point that he's making to them? Jenny cut the letter from their copy of Ross Milton's newspaper and placed it inside the cover of the family Bible. Then she turned to the pages where the family names were written in a long column with places to the right for dates of birth, marriage, and death. She dipped a pen in ink and carried it in the Bible to her father. Matt shook his head. You write a better hand than I do, Jenny. You set down the date and place for me. I've done it so often, too many times. He would not watch Jenny write, but motioned to Ellen to help him walk outside under the silver poplars in the dooryard. Jethro sat at his sister's side and studied the page to which she had turned. His own name was at the bottom of the long list. Jethro Hallam Crichton, born January 13th, 1852. That was the name of the old doctor that the folks set such store by, Jenny explained, Dr. Jethro Halloran, or Hallam. I remember him just a little. He used to hold me on his lap and once he'd give me candy because I didn't cry when he had to swab my throat. Jethro looked at her respectfully. She knew people in times unknown to him. He could not agree with his father that Jenny was so very young. Directly above his name were three lines that his father had filled out just 10 years ago that summer. Matthew Colvin Crichton, born September 7, 1850, died July 1st, 1852. And this is why I'm gonna reference my book because I have their ages. So he was not even two years old when he died from that, um, not plague, but the paralysis that, that, that was going through the country. James Alexander Crichton, born May 3rd, 1849, died July 4th, 1852, so he was three. Nathan Hale Crichton, born February 12th, 1848, died July 3rd, 1852, and he was four. So the, they're marking down in this Bible, all of their family members, when they're born, um, when they died, and there's some other events that they'll mention here as well. The tragedy of that summer had never impressed Jethro so deeply as it did that afternoon when the dates stared up at him with terrible significance. Do you remember them, Jenny? He asked soberly. Oh yes, they're growing more and more dim in my mind though. I can remember that Ma set, set me to rock in little Matt's cradle once, and I got so carried away with my singing to him that I rocked the cradle too hard and the little brown baby rolled right out onto the floor. That stands out in my mind. I was so fearful that I'd hurt him. Jenny smiled a little. little. We was always wanting to hold the youngest one. Lots of times Mary and me, and even Nate, would fuss over who was to hold you next. Ma would say, Wait till he starts crying, then we'll see who wants him. And sure enough, once the crying started, we was ready to hand you over. It seemed very far away and unreal to Jethro. Sometimes I forget that they was older than I am. I always think of them as the little boys. I reckon that's the way it'll always seem. They'll never be old. It seems strange, don't it, Jenny, that the sickness struck the three of them and passed over the rest of us? She nodded. It's a thing no one can explain. I remember that Israel Thomas took Mary and Tom home with him. Eb wasn't yet with us, and Bill took you and me over to Ed Turner's. He carried you in his arms and led me by the hand, almost like he was our pa, though he wasn't much more than a boy then. Some of our folks made the rounds every day to see about us. They were so fearful that the disease might stri strike more of us. 
but we stayed well. It was a miracle. Now this is a part I've never stopped to talk about before, but it's kind of reminiscent of the time that we're in. Um, it's a very different type of quarantine, but they're taking those healthy children and moving them out away from those that are sick and quarantining them in a different place. Um, so this is not the first time it's necessarily happened in our country, although, and actually there was the, the Spanish flu in the early 1900s as well. Um, but it's new to us. So it's kind of neat to look back on history and see that there were other times when sickness and disease, and there were ways that we, you had to handle it to try to keep as many alive as you could. So they didn't all stay in the home. They, they moved some of those kids out to try to keep them still healthy. All right. So we're right about halfway down 113. Her name was next on the list. Jenny Elizabeth Crichton, then the name Mary Ellen Crichton with the date of her death, January 12, 1859, written far out in the right-hand column. Above was the line Jenny must fill out, Thomas Ward Crichton, born May 10, 1843. She made the notation, died at Pittsburgh Landing, April 6, 1862, with great care, and she wiped her eyes quickly lest the ink of the record be smudged. The long list climbed on. In the years 1837 and 1838, John Robert and William Taylor were born, the two who had once been closest in affection. Cut from the same bolt, Ellen had said. Above these were three other names that belonged to complete strangers as far as Jethro was concerned. The twin girls, Lydia and Lucinda, long since married and moved to Ohio, were born in 1834. The name at the top of the list was Benjamin Hardin Crichton, born in 1832. After his name, Matt had written, left for California in 1849. I wonder if he ever found any gold, Jethro mused. Jenny shook her head, and he noticed that her face looked very tired. To cheer her, he pointed to the space for a marriage date opposite her name. Someday we'll be writing in this space, married to Shadrach Yale, and then your wedding date. The smiles and blushes that usually came at the mention of Shadrach were missing that day. Jenny's dark eyes were large and grave. I am going to pause our video. Sorry for the interruption. Um, I don't know if you heard the screaming outside the door, but I wanted to make sure the kids were doing what they needed to do. We're almost done with our chapter, so I just wanna to try to wrap that up. The smiles and blushes that usually came at the mention of Shadrach were missing that day. Jenny's dark eyes were very large and grave. I'm so scared, Jeff. Seems I hadn't known what war was till Danny Lawrence come bringing us this awful word of Tom. She closed the Bible and crossed her forearms on its faded cover. I used to dream about the nice home Shad and me would have and how I'd keep it bright and pretty, how I'd wait of an evening to see him coming down the road toward home. Nowadays, I don't make pl any plans. I just don't dare to have any dreams for fear someday a soldier will come home and tell us that he was standing beside Shad the way Danny was standing beside Tom. So this is where we're gonna stop to answer, why did Jenny stop making plans? So she had been planning and hoping to marry Shadrach, but now she's changing those plans. And what is the reason? It's right there in that paragraph. She got up abruptly and put the Bible back on the shelf among the books Shadrach had left. Together, she and Jethro walked silently out to the barn lot and got their team ready to go back to the fields. They needed recreation and laughter as they needed food. In other years, the little house had buzzed with teasing and squabbling and hilarity of a crowd of young people. There had been dances and corn huskings and candy makings throughout the neighborhood. There had been afternoons of horseshoe pitching and evenings of charades. Shadrach had organized a singing school for winter nights, and sometimes there was a spell down at the school followed by a box supper, which was partly a fundraising project and partly an opportunity for romantic developments. 
Jethro had not participated in these activities, but he had watched the fun from the sidelines, and that had been enough. Some of the laughter and gaiety had overflowed to touch him, and he had felt himself a part of it. Okay, I'm gonna pause that for a second to explain a little bit of it, and then actually we'll stop our lesson for today because there's a little more than I had thought and more I wanted to talk about. Um, but at the end of this part, he, there's, he's talking about all of the things they used to do for recreation, and one of them, you might have jumped right over it, not known it, any idea what it was, but I had looked into it, it's kind of a fun idea. So first is the spell down, like a spelling bee. That's not the fun part, I don't think, for some of us, but I, I like that. But the next part was the box dinner, and they were saying that it was a fundraiser. So what they used to do is the girls would make a dinner, and they would bring it and put it in a pretty little box and decorate it. And then the boys would bid on these box dinners, which is why it was a fundraiser. And then they got to eat the dinner with whatever girl prepared that meal, which is why it was a chance for romantic um, things as well. It's kind of a fun idea. Um, so that, I just wanted to share that, that with you, that that's what that box dinner uh, was. It was a, a fun little romantic and fundraising thing. Um, which is why Jethro didn't participate. He was too young for that. That was for the older kids, the teenagers. Um, so like I said, we're going to stop this lesson because we're getting close to half an hour. And I know that I have some map explanations to do with the end of the chapter. So I will be adjusting um, the plan on your weekly plan that I had for week four um, as I get to that um, for the next round of flash drives. So tomorrow we'll probably be wrapping up this lesson, wrapping up your questions for chapter six and seven, preparing yourself for that quiz that you'll see within this week. So I hope you have a great day.